Hey everybody, and welcome to Absolute Apologetics. Today we'll be discussing moral relativism with a clip from Ravi Zacharias. If you're new here, consider subscribing. If you enjoy this video, hit the like button and share it with others. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so that you don't miss an episode. Let's get started. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Let's leave aside Christianity and historical examples for a second. All night you guys have been grappling with issues like morality and you know what is right, what is wrong, and meaning. But my question is simply, why are you so afraid of subjective moral reasoning? I mean, do you think that we're all just going to start raping and pillaging just because we don't have a book to tell us what to do? I mean, are you afraid of that? Like, I'm not, because that's not going to happen. And that, yeah, Nazis were bad, but there were Christian Nazis and there were atheist Nazis. So I don't see... What are you so afraid of? Do you lock the door at night? Oh! Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, you know, I hear what you're saying. Sounds very cavalier, though. My goodness. If we weren't afraid of all of this, we would not be in a national debt. The Ch billions. China is secular. Uh, uh, sorry? China is secular. Sorry? China is secular. That's right. What about, what does that I mean? I mean, they're not raping and pillaging, and neither are we. Oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my, oh my. Have you read what happened during the Red Guards Rebellion? Have you read what happened during the Boxer Rebellion? Do you know who has killed more people in the 20th century than China and Russia? 60 million apiece? Wow. It makes the Holocaust seem tame. The 20th century became the bloodiest century in history. And the reason it became the bloodiest century in history, I can see, is you could just see the weapons of our warfare were piling up and there was no guiding principle to take us anywhere. Now, in a perfect world, yes, we don't need to be afraid. Have you seen what happens in our courts of law? where people supposedly love each other and all that comes about in hate and vitriol and damage? I don't think the question is fairly stated as what have you, are you afraid of? I'm just saying it is basically unlivable. That's, I didn't conclude that. An atheist like Jean-Paul Sartre concluded it. We killed more people in the 20th century than the previous 19 put together. And your question is uh, what are we afraid of? The fact of the matter is, if morality is purely subjective, then you have absolutely nothing from stopping anybody for being a subjective moralist to choose to just zing one through your forehead and say, that's my answer. You know, how do you try to stop that? Obviously, you don't believe that's the way it should be. No, neither do I. So it's not a case of what am I afraid of. It's a case of the fact that if you're willing to say to me that... Uh, moral reasoning can be purely subjective. I just say to you, look out, you ain't seen nothing yet if everybody believed what you did. Do you know, uh, funny, interesting, when I was in, in the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, Stalin eliminated 15 million of his own people. 15 million of his own people. And at the Center for Geopolitical Strategy, you know, they didn't want to even name his name and so on. His daughter, Svetlana, made the comment. It is quoted both by Malcolm Muggeridge in his writings and by historian Paul Johnson in modern times. Svetlana was standing by the bedside of her father before he died. She said the last thing he did was clench his fist over the heavens one more time, put his head back on the pillow, and he was gone. This is his daughter raising the question, whatever got into my father to have that kind of hatred and hostility? And when 15 million were killed of his own people, it is interesting that the faculty members and the general who chatted with me there, my wife will tell you, sat around the table with tears in his eyes when he watched what had been done to his own country by his own leadership. 
So subjective morality would be very good if we all wanted to be nice people and live around each other without any uh, fear of each other. But the reason you lock your doors and the reason we have our police and the reason we have our military and the reason we have our law courts is because when subjective morality becomes totally subjectivized, this is what happens in society. So it's a great idea, but I hope nobody absorbs it. Thank you. Frank Turek, the well-known co-author of the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, says, if there's no objective morality, then love is no better than murder. At first glance, this statement appears to be quite extravagant to say the least. Any rational person knows that there's a stark contrast between love and murder. So isn't it absurd to say that there is a world where these two things could be equal? Surprisingly enough, the world of moral relativism lays the groundwork for this kind of absurdity to exist in real time. The fact that we all know innately that love and murder are opposite concepts on the moral spectrum is reason to believe that moral relativism is a bankrupt ideology. In the world of relative morality, we find that the definition of right and wrong is decided by popular opinion and human desire. This means that one society could consider murder as a grievous crime, while at the same time a different society could consider murder as a utilitarian good, and neither could say that the other is acting immorally. The need for a transcendent and objective moral code is made obvious by the morally bankrupt nature of relativism. Unless absolute morality exists, Morality itself is an illusion. Most people would see it as self-evident that morality is much more than an illusion, but rather something grasped innately by all rational people. To argue that morality is an illusion is to argue against the fabric of human conscience itself. Moral relativism is the argument that morality as an objective truth is nothing more than an illusion. Is this the kind of world that we are meant to live in? Even worse, if molecule to man evolution is true, our conception of morality is nothing more than a chemically constructed belief. Richard Dawkins said that the universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. I must say, I appreciate the frankness of Dawkins in this statement, as many atheists try very hard to avoid the logical conclusion of moral relativism. Dawkins faces this absurdity right in the face and admits it. One must ask, is this the kind of world that we want to live in? a world in which love and murder could be considered equally moral, a world in which there is no higher morality available to humankind so that we may live in a way that is truly honorable. Thankfully, the world of relative morals is the imaginary one. The world of relative morals is the world brought into existence by secularists. These secularists are bent on ridding society of God. It is the only alternative to the reality that murder is objectively wrong and love is objectively good, as confirmed by a transcendent creator who has the proper qualifications to define good and evil absolutely. Many atheists are terrified at the reality that the only way to truly justify morals is if they come from an all-knowing, all-loving, omnipresent, all-powerful, eternal being, namely, the God of the Bible. If the source of morality is not omnipresent or eternal, then he would not be capable of true omniscience, as there may be a time in the past or a place that he doesn't know about. If the source of morality is not omniscient, then there may be a better version of morality that he hasn't learned about. If the source of morality is not all-loving, then morality 
is destined to produce standards which fall short of true love. And finally, if the source of morality is not all powerful, then even perfect morality would be useless and unable to be implemented in such a way that the greatest good would ultimately result. Moral relativism can only be considered objectively good if moral relativism is false. This renders it logically incoherent and worthy of rejection from all reasonable people. Unless objective morality is embraced by humankind once again, we are destined to cannibalize ourselves with opinionated morals that have no foundation in a transcendent truth. God help us. I want to thank you for watching Absolute Apologetics. What did you think about this episode? Let us know in the comments, but keep it civil. If you're new here, consider subscribing. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button and share it with others. Hit the notification bell so that you don't miss an episode. You can find more content like this at our website, biblicalquestions.net. We'll see you next time.